Hey guys, what up? It's currently 6.03 p.m. I'm starting my next vlog and I will see you soon. I'm gonna have some dinner and watch some YouTube. So, yeah. Bye. Rub Hard Jones was the, he was the country DJ. He was, he was the country DJ at Y106. He was a huge personality around Atlanta. He used to do the WCW uh, ring announcing, Saturday night ring announcing when they take to the center stage, Rhubarb Jones. And so anyway, we were able to get all this television presence in Atlanta and got the Smoky Mountain show on through Joe and appreciated him for that. And Vince found out that we were going to run the Cobb Civic Center. Just, you know, and try to, to get that market opened up again because this was at the point in time where WCW had already bottomed out and had drawn at one point I can't remember whether it was they, one time they drew 500 people in the Omni or in the Philly Civic Center, or it may have been both, but they couldn't put a thousand people in the Omni in Atlanta for WCW with their national TV and all their names. So here goes Smoky Mountain Wrestling to run the Cobb Civic Center, right? So Vince McMahon finds out about it, says, uh, you need any on the WWF's radar because so many guys started going up. And that, that was a help to us later on in OVW as well. And, and so I think overall it was good. And plus I knew the, and except with the little messy little thing with Vince not going to jail, when that was, you know, all settled and everything, I knew that the leadership of the WWF was stable and I knew who I was going to be working for and with. And not like WCW where not had done anything with Watts, but once he was gone, I didn't trust any of them. And most of the people I did trust there didn't have the pull, right? So that we were able to do uh, more long-term shit, and and eventually, as I said, uh, I would have liked for Smoky Mountain to have, and so I thought we would go back and kind of examine the time period, because so many people have asked about it, and they seem to enjoy when we do deep dives behind the scenes, you can kind of hopefully get a better understanding of how a territory was run and, and operated, and <clears throat> the things that went on back in those days. Um, and I get, you know, I guess we should start out by kind of setting the scene up. We had started television in Knoxville for Smoky Mountain Wrestling in February of 1992. And the rule of thumb was, and we should have waited longer if we could afford it, but the rule of thumb back in those days, uh, the Kazana promotion and Johnson City was part of the Tri-Cities with Bristol and Kingsport. It had been Ron Wright's promotion, and they always worked back and forth together. And in both towns, it had been Hi guys. Continental towns. But in Knoxville, our first morning, we got on TV. PM. There were four TV stations so Friday night. on the air in Knoxville, Tennessee in yep. 1992. Um, and anyway. we got on number four. <laughs> Just chilling. Because Channel 10, uh, the Big Daddy, uh, not really doing uh, much. Ron Just Fuller's strong. Southeastern show in the 70s, and you could get everywhere but for 100 miles. They weren't in the wrestling business anymore. They were doing network college the basketball long. and the whole nine yards, so and it was, it was not going to happen. Hopefully, I'm thinking Channel they're 8 there. Channel 8 carried the WCW there. program, and they're they didn't pay to do that, and they wanted too excited. much money. Channel yeah. 6 did not have anything That's on the schedule, so we ended up in a really great deal. I'm getting actually photos printed out in March. Everything was going to shit. So and I have so to send them the entire website. In Knoxville, so, yeah. Actually, for the first year, the debut in Johnson a bunch City, of favorites on my phone was that I want to send. So, and it done better. And a few yeah, of the this, towns in, I will be a few of the shows in Johnson City, City too. Because I quite like how this is turning out. I'll show you what I mean. And, and, but both of them were slow I have to do the top half, developing. but I'll fix that. In, it's in fine. I don't work there. It's a crash right now. Stupid friggin' fan. Anyway, I'm gonna fix that and then do the rest. And then I will be colored in, but I'm not 100%. So, yeah. That the folks in the mountains without satellite dishes could get over the air. It was WYMT. It was an isolated world even back as recently as the 90s. So we had everything. And I even I put in a Golden Circle ticket. The first two rows we jacked up to 15. And then the return Russian roulette match where Tim Horner and the Night Stalker would be handcuffed to the ring post so they couldn't interfere with Kevin Sullivan. Yes, and, it's uh, he brought, I remember he brought Audrey. They made a, a trip, trip of it. And, I'm in bed by yeah, now. I'm 45. Took a few days off in the mountains or whatever. But he came all the way to Pikeville and Lance and Les did that show for me. So it was the best of Memphis announcers and the best Southeastern announcers. So that was cool.
Uh, but anyway, so and that's why the VHS tape exists out there today because we shot it. But the card was basically still. We had six matches, but it was a three match card because I still, you know, didn't want to go too overboard here. We had the main event was the Smoky Mountain Showdown. It was street fight rules. The last unbeaten team is the winner, and three men on each team: Bobby Eaton, Stan Lane, and Tom Pritchard. The bodies versus Fuller, Golden, and Dutch, the stud stable, versus Morton Gibson, the rock and roll, and Arn Anderson. That was Arn's final date with us. He started back uh, WCW the following day. And that was the that was the main event. Uh, and, there was no like, decisive finish for this matchup. I thought it was a little weird. I believe it's the only match in the entire show that has a deep finish. Morning. Well, What's up? This is the one that Coffee. Has it, I think is a little weird. Backstage, Terry it was just to chill for a bit, and then I'm not just sure what's going on actually, so, yeah, bye. Wouldn't it be great to have a pair of nunchucks made of cans of Hanson's energy drink? When I watch this match, all I can think of was, if these two guys wrestled today, you would never see them wrestle and match against each other in WWE, just because the way they kind of like segregated their uh, their weight classes now. You would never see X-Pac, who was a cruiserweight, going against a super heavyweight in Bradshaw here, which is a shame because this match is a very good, big, little match. I think X-Pac was more than a whole zone. Like just the last classic show I reviewed, Summerside 99, you see X-Pac in a match with three dudes who are like twice his size, Undertaker, Kane, and Big Show, and he does great with that. And he does the same here with Bradshaw, and in today's WWE, you would never see these two wrestle each other, and that's kind of a shame. Uh, X-Pac, right as the match begins, as he's making his entrance, he just like takes off one of the turnbuckle posts in the middle. He drags uh, Bradshaw in and starts ramming his face in the exposed turnbuckle post. At one point, Brad does do one more headbutt into it, even though X-Pac's no longer holding onto his head. And now, Brad is shot.
think Mark and Nina and I looking back to the very beginning of the decade, so as always, I call it a good, bad, and ugly countdown show. And I say that with the deepest affection, because you're an ugly, you might be my best, and the other way around. So we'll go back to uh, 1980 with us in the top 40 songs on the Billboard album 100. The Big 40 Countdown coming up at 5 o'clock. What up? I'm home. Um, about to go and take my pick off. Oop, much better. And then, yeah, I'm probably gonna end my vlog. So, yeah. Hey guys, what up? Um, my vlog is done. See you later. Bye.